In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zwijger livecast. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you. Welcome to Unmonumenting. This is a program uh, developed by Stichting NDSM Werf in collaboration with Pakhuis de Zwijger and Public Art Amsterdam. And this program has been made possible with the support of the Nieuwe Institute. This next hour, we will dive into the global current discussion about monuments. Who is represented and visible in public space? Why and who determines that? Does this situation, because there's been a lot of debate the past year about representation, about monuments, does this situation demand a new strategy? And how can we reimagine monuments and even future monuments in public space? This afternoon we will have an exploratory conversation around the ideas on how to create landscapes of memories, healing public environments through art, and the importance of diversity and polyphony in public space. To give you a little bit of context, Stichting NDSMWerf, yes, that's the well-known wolf in the northern part of Amsterdam with all the creative, has got a large uh, heritage. But right now the location itself hardly shows the history besides the mon monumental architectural buildings. This program will be a starting point for a bigger project that researches ways on how to make on-site history more visible. And that a way to do that is by creating new monu monuments. So what can you expect? We kick off with inspirational examples by two international speakers. That's Ken Lum and Christian Benimana. Joining me here in the studio and a warm welcome to you is performer, installation and movement artist Joy Mariama Smith. Joy, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, you will join me in talks. Uh, you will reflect on the presentations that our two other speakers will give. But to get to know you a little bit more, uh, tell us a little bit more about your own background and how that shapes your view on the theme of to today, the, the, the view on monuments. Uh, sure. Thanks again for having me. I think, um, first of all, around monumenting, being originally born and raised in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which is in the northeast of the United States. I think that's also important because the United States is large and there's really quite some different cultural perspectives depending on uh, what part of the United States you're from. Uh, also being from a state that it was part of the original 13 colonies um, is different than someone maybe from the West Coast. So the subject of monuments and growing up in Philadelphia where there are, you know, the Constitution is there and the building that the Constitution is in is there. And that was part of my upbringing. And then moving to the Netherlands, coming from practicing as an architectural designer for 15 years, but also making art that is based on researching the body and space. I've always been very interested in public space versus private, but also how our body relates and even more specifically a somatic relationship to the built environment. So the subject of monuments, I think, is an interesting point to think about, uh, not just now, but in the past uh, as well as the future. Mm. Well, it's, it's interesting because uh, society is changing constantly and it seems that the monuments are frozen in time and people consider them to be, you know, stable, static, not you know, adaptable. What is your opinion on that? Are they adaptable? Should they be adapted? Uh, well, from, again, where I'm from, where a place where things are getting torn down, I think something that once was static can certainly be moved or altered in a way which makes it more dynamic um, as a political act. And um, I have a certain curiosity around moving away from the monument as statue or monument as structure, because in the etymology of the word, it's just about reminding or memory. And I think that can be, I mean, as we know, memory is a dynamic mm. thing. So 
it's an interesting little puzzle that I'm excited to talk about. All right. Any expectations about the conversation that we'll going to have and the speakers that will address some issues? Um, no, I'm really just coming uh, with an open mind and I'm certain that I will be stimulated and that conversation will be very thought provoking. <laughs> very good. Well, let's kick off with a presentation by renowned artist and co-founder of Monuments Lab in Philadelphia, Ken Lum. Ken is joining us through Zoom. Ken, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, great to see you. Um, how are you? Very good. And how is COVID treating you? Because that's a new world that we've entered uh, into. Is, is well, it... <laughs> well, I think in the United States, it's a particular disaster. So, and it has to do with the way um, uh, you, you, Americans look, define freedom in a very highly individualized uh, manner hmm. at the cost of uh, the greater good. Right. Well, unfortunately, we don't have time to extend on that conversation, although very interesting. Um, you are going to share a story uh, about Monument Lab with us. Um, yeah. I would like yeah. to say the virtual floor is yours. Okay. thanks very much. I'll just share the screen. Yeah, Monument Lab started in uh, 2012. I was uh, new to Philadelphia. I was hired by the University of Pennsylvania to uh, renovate and innovate the uh, Department of Fine Arts, which had been um, uh, stagnating, apparently, according to the former dean uh, for a number of years. And I was hired to uh, invigorate it with a uh, new purpose and so on. And very shortly after I moved to Philadelphia, I lived very near, um, maybe only 50 meters away from Billie Holiday's house, the great, great singer, tragic uh, Philadelphian. And um, I noticed this marker. And in, in Philadelphia, there's over 1,000 uh, public statues and maybe even equivalent, if not more, numbers of, of markers to historical figures uh, and, and so on. In the same day, I walked up to uh, City Hall because it's a beautiful uh, building, and um, I found this statue on the right of John Wanamaker, um, who was the who was a business person who ran the Wanamaker's department store. And uh, it's an officially uh, sanctioned uh, statue because it sits right on the grounds of City Hall itself. And I started to think about the unevenness uh, uh, in terms of the monumental inventory of, of a city, whereby the great Billy Holiday has only a marker, but John Wanamaker, uh, someone I never heard of until I moved to Philadelphia, has official recognition by City Hall. I'm not saying John Wanamaker doesn't deserve recognition, but I am suggesting that Billie Holiday certainly deserves uh, recognition. I just want to underline that point by saying Philadelphia, of course, also has the connection to cinema through the movie Rocky. And uh, still Sylvester Stallone donated a, a bronze statue of Rocky um, to uh, sit near the steps of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And it's become a real tourist magnet uh, just for people to uh, identify with this um, unsung hero, working class hero who is obviously fictional. And but my the point I want to press is that Rocky Balboa statue is actually owned by the city of Philadelphia. So it's sanctioned officially by the city of Philadelphia, while Joe Frazier on the right was a real world heavyweight champion. Uh, he actually uh, beat Muhammad Ali to to um, uh, secure the heavyweight ch uh, championship of the world. And he's from North Philadelphia. And there are no officially sanctioned statues of Joe Frazier in Philadelphia. In 2015, uh, there was a private initiative by Comcast, which is a big media company, and they commissioned a full figure statue on their grounds, but that is still a, uh, not, that is still a, a private uh, endeavor, not a, a, an official the sanctioned one, unlike Rocky Balboa. And so this question of the unevenness in terms of who gets represented, who does not get represented, who is heated, who is not heated, it forms the basis for Monument Lab. I was working at the Philadelphia, uh, uh, in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania, and I was teaching courses on uh, spatial production and public art. And my colleague, Paul Farber, who teaches in urban studies, was, was also asking similar uh, questions in terms of uh, the class he, he, was, he taught. And so we joined heads and discovered that we had been asking many of the same questions in terms of the negative histories, the subjugated knowledges that are not 
um, made apparent and the unevenness of the inventory of, of statues and markers that really bear witness to the uh, and speak truth to power in terms of the distribution of um, the, the empowered versus the disempowered or those without power. And so we formed Monument Lab. We came up with a whole bunch of uh, newspapers in advance of the exhibition where we uh, wrote essays in each one. There were free articles we handed out to uh, people. We printed several thousand uh, copies and just kind of handed it out at various art galleries and various cultural sites and so on. So, and, and I stress that because it's very important to note that Monument Lab is not simply a studio or not simply, uh, we're not curators necessarily about, um, you know, making a, a biennial type show. We are doing that, but but even more importantly, we are supplementing it as a kind of de de uh, project of democracy, whereby we gather data from uh, the citizen, citizenry of, of Philadelphia in terms of in terms of how their lives are led and their perspectives on monument. And, and we do not, uh, we are totally non-elitist. We do not frame our question in terms of when we ask citizens of Philadelphia, you know, we don't try to lead with uh, leading questions. We just ask some very simple questions such as what is an appropriate monument for the current city of Philadelphia? And we accept all answers. We do not filter and so on. So it's very important to have, I think, an academic knowledge producing component to an exhibition to steer it away from simply a kind of uh, biennial form where the work of art shows up and then it disappears. And, and we were very, uh, we wanted to do the exhibition such that it took over pretty well every aspect of the city. Uh, there's actually two blue dots to the north here, which um, unfortunately is not, not showing because it's cut off in this image. But there were many, many sites throughout every part of the city, including Fair Hill, which is the poor, poorest of the 57 neighborhoods in Philadelphia. We wanted the viewer of Monument Lab to take in the entire exhibition by embodying experientially a visit and a tour of every part of Philadelphia, including the poorest and uh, disenfranchised parts of the city. And this is our process. We have a question. We dig into research about a statue site or public space that includes provenance, that includes iconographic art historical analysis, that includes digging into the uh, past ownership, past reception of a work. We connect and organize and exchange ideas with stakeholders invested in places of memory. That includes asking questions of the people who live in proximity to a particular statue and uh, as well, and not just academics, but also non-academics, because we um, too often ignore the advice given by citizenry uh, at our peril. We also unfix, we redefine the conversation between past, present, and future of monuments. We don't just accept how the, the character of the monument as eternal, universal, and, and consensual, that, but that there are parallel uh, narratives that the monument does not project, but maybe can be uncovered by reading the hegemonic power of a monument. We also build experimental platforms. This is where we have creative and intellectual um, responses uh, often taken from the lessons of contemporary art and participatory research um, projects to respond to a monument. And that monument, that could take the form of a dance performance, uh, marking up the monument, uh, doing all kinds of funny things to it and so on. And we call those the prototype. And then in the end, we gather all the data. We, after surveying people, we ask them for, you know, their opinions on current monuments, what is missing in terms of the uh, monuments, what would you like to see in terms of monuments? So for example, when we were doing the exhibition, we asked people and a lot of people said, well, well, I'm not so interested in a monument, but I would like the city to commit to better public schools. And so we would just add that into the data and then we would come up with a report for the, for the city uh, to the mayor's office. And very quickly, this is just an two or three examples of some of the works that we commissioned for Monument Lab. And uh, this is uh, the battle is joined by Karen Olivier where she clads an entire monument, existing monument, uh, war monument in, in mirror form. And when we did this in Germantown, the P, which is a his, which is a uh, African American neighborhood. When we first went there, many of the African American um, 
community groups in that area was suspicious of us and asked why would why we wanted to do something there since they felt that the city never cared about them and why should we care uh, why should we believe that you cared about us and so it took a lot of work a lot of dialogue a lot of meetings a lot of uh, trust building to um, uh, allow them to uh, allow Karen Olivier, who's also African-American, to make this work. And we did a lot of um, projects there. We had supplemented this with all kinds of public talks. Normally public talks takes place in official venues downtown and so on. And this is far from downtown. And we would set up a, a temporary stage and have all kinds of things, free food and so on, and all kinds of debates in terms of the history of Germantown neighborhood, how to improve it, what would you like to see? What sort of problems you confront? And so on. So we had this kind of social science, if you will, dimension to, to every site we, we engaged with. And this is a work by the great Cuban uh, artist, uh, Tonya Bruguera, a monument to the new immigrant in which uh, it's an unfired clay. The head is uh, shaven so that there's no definable face. And uh, it's unfired. So over the course of the exhibition, the um, clay starts falling off. And what you see at the end of the exhibition is just a bunch of uh, shattered clay with the steel armature underneath. And this is what they mean by uh, data collecting. It's very uh, old fashioned, low tech. We ask people on the clipboard, what would you like to see? And then we gather, where, where would you like to place your monument? Name of your monument, what is your name? And where do you live? What, what um, zip code do you live in? And then we uh, gather up all this information. We had over 200,000 um, interactions and close to 40,000 um, um, actual submissions over time. And then we would typologize each of them in terms of a kind of Google Cloud uh, form uh, in terms of what sorts of emphasis and monuments uh, people wanted. One thing that was very interesting and illuminating was that in 1985, there was a terrible uh, firebombing of a big, large section of West Philadelphia uh, called the MOVE bombing, which is a real disastrous um, by the city, and which the city has not until very recently even acknowledged and apologized for. They only apologized a few weeks ago, actually. And uh, about 3.5% of all respondents said there should be some sort of acknowledgement in the form of a, a monument or memorial to the MOVE bombing. So while 3.5% may seem small out of 100%, it is, we did think it was statistically significant because it showed us that Met the memory of the citizenry of Philadelphia is long and we need to heed the people. And so these sorts of sorts of things we would give to people as a kind of cue. We look at uh, a, a pedestal and then we find a monument that depicts a single person in the circles above. We ask them to write down some of the people who would have made this person's work possible. Anyone who might have been associated with them, taken care of it, uh, collaborated with them or on whom they depended and so on. And so we have these kind of graphic, fun, kind of uh, marker-ready uh, papers, sheets of paper, which people are, are glad to fill out. And we, as I mentioned earlier, we have, a, this is King, the great King Brit, fantastic musician from Philadelphia. And we had all kinds of things where, you know, teaching kids how to uh, do, uh, do uh, DIY projects and, uh, and King Brit is teaching uh, these children how to do electronic music and then to make a monument using uh, electronic music and so on. So we had literally hundreds of these types of programs in addition to the art project of uh, Monument Lab. And then they would also take place in very unpredictable areas of the city at unpredictable times. And then we just send it out. And uh, this is by Emeka uh, 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 Ogbo, the great Nigerian artist, and uh, a sound sculpture. And then we would just send out notices through social media saying, hey, we've got an event taking place on the roof of the uh, Philadelphia Library, which is almost never used. In fact, very few of the public even know that that's a public space that's in use and so on. And so people are, are always surprised in discovering these sorts of events. And here's a typical talk. This is in the courtyard of City Hall with the great Hank Willis Thomas in the blue shirt. And we had all kinds of talks. We asked. Uh, the Philadelphia Eagles linebacker, who is an American foot, gridiron football, to uh, talk about monuments. We asked the mayor of the city. We asked the uh, leader of the uh, LGBTQ uh, community to speak. We asked the police chief. 
right? And uh, we had no holds barred. People could ask any question they want uh, of the police chief and, and, and so on. And this was the report to the city, um, which was uh, almost like a book form. All the data which we compiled, um, this is obviously just a very quick synopsis. Here you can see 16 proposals, mo proposed monuments to Joe Frazier, 35 proposed monuments to the move bombing, 12 proposed monuments to abolitionists, 209 proposals for monuments to women. There are over 1,000 statues in Philadelphia. Uh, of the 1,000, there are only two historical full-figure uh, statues of women, for example. The, there are other statues of women, but they tend to be angels and muses and fictional type characters. And so, and then we came out with a, with a book. Um, and we thought it was very important. It shouldn't be a catalog. I wrote an essay in it. My colleague, Paul Farber, wrote an essay as well. And as I mentioned, it's very important that it's also about knowledge production in addition to creative responses. And we have since been expanding to our, the Monument Lab method to other cities, including St. Louis, Memphis, Baltimore, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New Orleans, Newark, um, Memphis, uh, Chicago, Toronto, uh, Vancouver, and more recently, Munich, Germany, and Antwerp, very near uh, where you are. That's, that's very, very, very impressive. It's really, really nice. Uh, can I ask some questions about yeah, the presentation that you gave? This, this was the last image, sorry if I went over. And uh, very recently we received a $4 million uh, US grant from the Mellon Foundation to do a national monument audit of the entire United States. Okay, thank you. Perfect. <laughs> no, it's, it's very inspiring. It's inspiring to see what you've done and how you democratized, dem, dem, make, more, made the process more democratic. Um, there are two things that uh, struck me in your presentation. One is that uh, there seems to be a hierarchy in who needs a monument, who needs representation as well. That's the example that you gave, uh, in, that you started with Billie Holiday. And the other side is uh, by demo democratizing, what, what's the English word, democratizing, democratizing, democratizing yes. uh, the, the process, isn't that inherently uh, uh, opposed to how monuments work? Weren't they always elitist? Weren't they always just for, for, for a select few? And isn't that, you know, connected to the structure, the process of how monuments were erected in, 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 in history? Of course, monuments are always about uh, a, a symbolic um, embodiment of the disequilibrium of, po of power, right, of the power uh, empowered over the disempowered. And that's always been uh, monuments. And they try to uh, force a unit, unidirectional uh, narrative in terms of the unquestioning consensus that the narrative that they project cannot be challenged hmm. when, when indeed there are multiple histories at any given time as you know. And so uh, the democratizing project is to, to, is to deconstruct that singular narrative and power of monuments to o open up uh, space for alternative histories to be uh, at least discussed, if not represented. Right. And what you, we saw the past couple of, mo of months is that, the, you know, the, the stories that the narratives that the monuments told were being questioned. And in some cases, monuments were, uh, were torn down. Um, is that, a th what's, what do you think of that process? Is that something that you support or oppose to? Well, I, I think I have to give a uh, qualify that uh, an answer because First of all, I want to say that the consensus and uh, the kind of permanent of uh, uh, an unchallenged uh, kind of narrative projected by monuments is something that's also constructed. For mm -hmm. example, there's a lot of expense and a lot of official sanctioning that goes into um, in, in, in maintaining a bronze statue, mm -hmm. right? We see it as like eternal and permanent, but it's actually something which is constructed, meaning that someone has to pay money for it to be cleaned Twice a, twice a year, there has to be all kinds of security to make sure that no one vandalizes it, and so on. And so it's a kind of myth that somehow these things are but are, are, are eternal, right? But but it's but it's projected as eternal because we don't see people cleaning it. We just assume that they are eternal, right? Now, in terms of the question of um, tearing down monuments, obviously for like uh, something like a Confederate monuments that have no bearing on the real truth of. Uh, of the, of the uh, Civil War, I think they do need to come down. But I also think it behooves us that before the point of taking something down, that there should be extensive 
dialogue by and creative responses by artists and intellectuals and academics in terms of before the point of taking something down. I think it's not so productive in a way or possibly even a mistake if you take something down in the middle of the night and there's been no dialogue about why that statue needed to come down. Right. Um, thank you so much for now, Ken. Uh, we will talk a little bit more with Joy about the creative responses that artists possibly can give. But uh, thanks so much for your presentation and thank you for your thought-provoking ideas. Uh, thank you, Ken. Um, next up, we have Christian uh, Benimana with us. He's a senior principal and managing director at the architecture studio Mass Design, um, the Mass Design Group, and he currently leads the implementation of the African Design Center in Rwanda. Christian, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? A very warm welcome to you. Just a quick check. How are you doing? I'm well. I'm, I'm, I'm doing good. Yeah, Thanks the, for asking. We've, we've, we've li we were living, uh, currently at the moment we live in strange times, but that gives us the opportunity to have you with us through Zoom. Um, you're highlighting a pro special project from the Mass Design Group. So to you as well, I would like to say the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to use three different projects because they speak to our work and uh, how we think about um, working in this space of memorial. Um, uh, but first I want to state that um, I think I'll not <coughs> um, go back again and talk about you know, the need to understand whose memory we're presenting uh, through you know, these monuments and, and these memorial spaces. I think Kenneth made a very good compelling um, presentation and arguments about how you know, we should change and do that better as, as community. But I'll talk about once we have decided that this memory is important and we need to memorize it, how we need to interrogate um, the processes in which we do create these spaces and um, the, the kind of like uh, targets we put in for them to achieve, um, for them to not be as the static object that I think all of us tend to believe that they haven't served the, prop the purpose um, of this type of like memory um, in the past. So, you know, we, we as a firm, we believe that, you know, architecture as a process has this power to be able to transform the spaces that we inhabit and therefore like um, impact our lives in positive ways if we deploy it, you know, in an in, in intentional manner and, uh, and we want to create a positive impact. And, you know, it possesses the same equal, if, if not more destructive power, if deployed um, in, in the wrong ways. And I think also like Kenneth made like very good examples of like how that's been utilized in the past and, and why we need to rethink how we, we utilize that. So I think when we approach this work in, in memory spaces for us, you know, it's a question of like, you know, creating memorial space that, that forces us to embrace hard truths um, and inspire reflection and change. And I want to highlight um, our first project in the memory space. Uh, this is a, 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 a project we proposed uh, as part of the 20th anniversary uh, for the commemoration of the 1994 genocide against Tutsi, which happened in the country of Rwanda, the country I am, native, I am a native of. Um, and in rethinking um, basically what that memorization would be like, um, I think we worked off from like a very strong uh, type of like national wide efforts to try to wrestle with that, the truth, the hard truths of such a tragedy, but be able to utilize it in, in, in a very positive way. And, and that kind of like national wide efforts like had created um, a situation in which the commemoration of the genocide against the Tutsi was very well documented through the process it went to create justice and reconciliation, you know, toward, towards the perpetrators and the victims, uh, but also like how the, the nation came together and decided that we're going to utilize or we're going to, 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 to base our beliefs and, 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 and prosperity on this collective memory and move ahead with it and, and not, you know, make it um, a, a point of contention or a point of holding us back. So um, this memorial basically like 
reflects that like power of a single uh, story of of a single person and all these like um, chambers um, that are well lit uh, represents like places where people record their own stories and testimonies of what has happened in this period of time, especially for the victims and the perpetrators. Um, of this tragedy uh, so that like we can say that the, the country is built on this story and uh, at the end of the day when dark comes uh, which is very representative of you know that time the country went through like these uh, these individual spaces these the individual like collection um, uh, spaces for these stories becomes like the beacons of the uh, of this hope like symbolizes like the hope of the country that says like it is possible to emerge through this dark and be able to, um, you know, to get to a better place. And I think Rwanda as a country, if, you know, people don't know about it, I, get, I think it's a good example of that. Uh, it's not perfect. There's still a lot of work to be done, but I think this has introduced us to understand the full extent our work in memory spaces needs to be ingrained in, um, in a system that is is fully supported by our communities. And I think Kenneth made a very, very good uh, uh, argument talking about uh, some of those uh, rituals that we don't see or we don't perceive as part of these monuments. But whenever that monument is erected, those rituals start happening. And we, because we don't see it, we don't interact with them, we never question the impact they have on the people. So for instance, if we talk about a, a, confederate, a confederacy statue um, and there's a I don't know an african-american person whose job is to clean it every uh, I don't know twice every year um, and what that does to the psyche of that person I think we never question that because that process is kind of like hidden behind us and if we you know if we believe that that type of like ritualization of that monument can have like a negative or positive impact uh, on that person or a group of people, and then we can also like utilize it intentionally uh, to create positive impact. So this memorial being part also like at the center of like um, every year's commemoration of the 1994 genocide against Tutsi becomes this place where like the collection of these stories, um, uh, the, the consumption of these stories, the understanding of those stories, like can actually become like a, you know, a really good moment of pause and, and reflection um, and, and, you know, commitment to change for the better. Um, this is another project we worked on. It, it's, a, um, it's the National Memorial to Peace and Justice. We worked with like an amazing organization, Eco Justice Initiative, and, and they've worked in this space for many, many years. Uh, they've like, we've done like tremendous research to try to understand uh, the effect of lynching and its legacy in shaping uh, America, especially the um, the African American community, uh, from back in the days of slavery all the way to uh, these current days that they label as mass incarceration. That's the type of like era that they define, um, and, and where like this type of like act of they call like act of terror had actually shaped physically um, the United States and how and where like communities of colors could live or not live, um, and so like. It's the same approach is basically is what happened. Basically, like how do we make sure like not only the space we create does uh, shed the light to the scale and the complexity um, and, and the, the untold stories that you know is hidden behind um, this act that you know can simply be defined as like a, a, you know a simple um, horror stories, uh, but instead like find a way of making it interactive and reactionary and, you know, uh, provocative to a, 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 a process uh, or a commitment to change. And, and, and one of the things that we managed, the, the, one of the ways we managed to do that, I won't talk about, you know, how the memorial is designed. I think that would, that would, that would um, you know, would take another um, whole lecture. But I think one of the things I want to highlight here is, is that like every, um, every cotton steel um, that is hung in the memorial, which represents each county in which these horrific things happened, uh, has a duplicate uh, outside of the, the memorial. And that duplicate will have to be claimed by the county. And by claiming that, um, 
that that that, that cult and steel box uh, and erecting it in that particular county, and then that county like uh, you know shows commitment to want to um, embrace this this truth and want to change for the better. And and actually, like this this memorial, like its landscape is going to transform, is going to change because way these um, cult and steel boxes are, are laid out in the in the in the in the in the landscape is also planted uh, with 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 trees that are going to grow and, and you know like also symbolizes like rejuvenating um, of ourselves, of our community, of our planet as we reckon with this this truth and we embrace it. Um, then the other, the last project I want to highlight is the Gun Violence Memorial. And I think here we were wrestling with uh, with this question that also like many organizations, I think in the United States have, you know, been been trying to, to work with hard with. So we work with, uh, again, you know, the amazing Hank Wills Thomas, um, we worked with like two organization, Purpose um, of a Pain and Every Town for Gun Safety. And, and they really wanted to figure out a way of like, how do we make sure that gun violence victims in the United States are not reduced to simple statistics because that's, that's the, the, the danger when our work is not effective. We just reduce people and stories and their narratives and their lives to simple figures in a spreadsheet. So one of the things that we, we really, again, emphasized on is the process of creating this monument, like who contributes to building it um, and how is that process curated in a way that is also um, uh, made to heal the people uh, and, and the outcome uh, is not merely like a representation of people as figures and numbers but like really like try to capture um, these, these stories and these narratives like from an emotional standpoint so that we never forget that even though these are statistics but there's like real lives, real emotions, uh, real feelings behind this, this, this project. Um, this we uh, we opened it in um, in October 2019 at the um, at the Chicago Cultural Center. It was there until February uh, this year. Uh, but the aim is really to 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 bring it to uh, Washington D.C. and and see if we could actually have like a permanent uh, monument that honors the victims. And the the thing that was interesting about this project is that is that these objects that believe, that belongs to the to the to the, to the the victims were donated by their families. They were asked to donate something that they held dear when they lost their loved ones. And that process of like donating that was a very integral part. It was recorded. It was well curated by like professionals who are not us, um, but we were very present to also be able to kind of like absorb that type of like intensive, that type of like healing process to be able to understand the value like that t-shirt we got meant for that person or that photograph or that, um, you know, that, that toy uh, that that mother like had kept as, as, the, as the living memory of their child or, or, or their brother or their sister or their, their parent. So this, this is the, the way we envision the, 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 the memorization of, of, uh, of collective memory, of course, like, you know, through architecture is, is the way we know how best to do it. Uh, but I think, the, I think to the question of today, I think the way we need to change it is to think less about how we need to change monuments and me museums and mem memory spaces, but how do we question the process in which they are created? Because the, you know, ha having uh, confederacy monuments uh, that are scattered all over the US that people now are like, you know, we, we're saying we're gonna take down, it's one thing, and I think that's you know should happen uh, if it's justified. But again, like how do we question the process in which that has come to be there, and how do we understand the impact, the ritualization that comes with the presence of these things have on our communities, whether visible or invisible, and how can we be intentional about utilizing um, that ritualization? to make sure like what we create at the end of this process of architecture of creating memory spaces is actually ingrained in society that is committed to heal. And how does that also contribute to making the memorials themselves? Happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Christian. It's, it's also very impressive. Um, there are a couple of questions that I have uh, straight away because 
um, what you mentioned is uh, that uh, monuments become places of remembrance, um, and it's 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 sometimes a place of healing as well. Um, and the process to that to that monument is very interesting. But th what I wonder is, uh, are those monuments intended to be future proof? In other words, what happens if people start forgetting? the story or forgetting the urgency. Collective memory is fickle in some some senses. So what what if the you know the story, you know, isn't that well known anymore? What happens to that monument? And that's that's exactly the point, because um, you know, we architects at some point you need to acknowledge that our level of interventions um, does have limitations. And beyond wearing our hats as architects, we also need to understand that we work and um, act as citizens of our communities and societies. So, you know, our job does not end because we finish that museum or that memorial or that, that monument, uh, but it, it really like continues through our active participations as citizens of those communities to make sure like those memories that we cherish do not, um, fade as you say so beyond uh, cutting the ribbon at the end of that that um, that that that, uh, that project we also have to stay involved in the conversations we need to go to um, uh, to the meet community meetings we need to go uh, we need to be involved in like with the work of organizations that are fighting for that and if like that outlives our lives and that memory fades and everything else and I think we need to figure out a way that that monument itself like has a way that is embedded in that still speaks to us or to people who will visit at that time and be able to understand it. And it's very possible that there will be a time that those realities are also contested. Mm. And we can't work, we can't think or work out something that projects beyond that. So I guess, you know, the future architects are going to have to figure out what to do with mm. what we've created today. Yeah. Another thing that I wondered is, what do you think are the most important preconditions in order to create the memory, uh, memorial sites or monuments that you described? What should be taken care of in order to have the right sense of creating the right monument? I think the, the work that, um, uh, you know, Monuments Labs and Kenneth and Lam and people working in the same areas are doing, like, it's crucial, it's very important because one of the things that we need to make sure we understand architects before we get to the drawing boards is that we have actually gone through a lengthy and uh, inclusive process of making sure that we understand how we are collecting that memory, how it's going to be presented, what its limitations, and how it plugs into the current situations and the current communities, how they live, uh, what type of um, ritualization that we engage in as a community to be able to heal or, or to reflect on this memory or to change for the better. Because without that, uh, we'll basically be answering, um, you know, the wrong questions. So, and when you're answering the wrong question, it doesn't matter how good the answer is. Mm. Right. Um, my final question, because time is running out. Um, you're currently leading the implementation of the African Design Center in Rwanda. Um, what is the most important lesson that you hope to share with young makers when it comes to this aspect of community? Uh, that's a hard question. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think for for young designers, um, I, I would say this: that we need to consider every single space we make or don't make, but exists by you know the creation of you know. Uh, of us, human species, um, in some sense, in many senses, is a reflection, is a, is a uh, of a memory, a certain memory um, that we were there, that we existed, that there's a community that um, lived and thrived and tried to um, to transform that place to suit them. And uh, you know, if you watch these archaeological movies and, and documentaries like we, we we always try to find the stories of the lives of the the, the 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 what these things we uncover that have been you know earth for like millions and millions of years tell us and and and, and that should speak to how careful 
we need to be whatever we shape these things. I feel like when you talk about memory spaces as a typology, we are already working in uh, reactive mode. Uh, I think like the active mode would be to, be to make sure that when we're doing our work as architects and engineers and builders and, and, and sculptures and artists and everything else, like the intentionality about what those spaces or those monuments or those objects, those things that we create, say or, tell or talk about our society needs to be very carefully curated so that we do not reinforce things that do not allow us to move to a better place as mm. a society. All right. Thank you so much for your contribution. Again, very thought provoking, very interesting. And what I re recall is that oh, from, from your talk is that the, m the human side, the, the, com the communal side of taking people in account when talking and developing, but also maintaining monuments is very important. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more here at the table, but thank you so much for your contribution and hope to see you in real life uh, uh, in the near future as well. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Joy, this was very inspiring and, like I said, thought provoking. Any first reactions? If you look at the story that Ken told or of the, or the presentation that Ken gave, which described the hierarchy of monuments, but also challenges the process on how to develop monuments, what is your response to to his story? Um, well, I was very. I enjoyed. Uh most uh, seeing photographs of my, my hometown, Philadelphia. But the thing that stuck out from Ken's presentation and overall work with Monument Lab is these three words uh, around framing monuments, which were eternal, universal, and consensual. And I spent most of my time as I was listening to Ken thinking about what those relationships mean in terms of an object versus in terms of a social relationship or an emotional relationship, what that, what that could mean, hmm. which clearly those things have very different. Um, yeah, they're, they're complex, but if they have equal weight in considering what is a monument or not, what does that mean? And what, how do we begin to talk about the implications of those three words together? Hmm. Because what's interesting, because we saw two international examples, uh, but if we focus on the local context, I mean, here too, artists do create contemporary works that, that addresses themes as well, that challenges themes and look for new perspective on looking at monuments and the social role they can play as well. And, 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 and if we could take something away of the two examples that we just saw, what would that be for the local Amsterdam or Dutch context? Ooh, I think for me, in looking at both presentations, it's sort of, uh, and to hybridize my way of thinking, where acknowledging, I think one aspect would be to acknowledge that there is an unevenness in any historical narrative where there's a gap. Mm. Um, and I think we're talking specifically about monuments that are visible. Mm. And I think that's an important distinction in my culture where I come from, I think there are monuments that exist. I was thinking also around Ken's presentation where in West Philly or one of the neighborhoods that I've lived and in other neighborhoods in Philadelphia, there's a gesture of like throwing sneakers up on a, on a phone line. I actually yeah. don't know. And this is, uh, I remember being a child and, and asking what that meant. And it's, it's sort of a monument in some way. It's also a signal, but mm. I don't, I don't need to get into that. So thinking about um, this unevenness and how we can have a discourse, but also with Christian and this idea of memory spaces and ritual, where even though a space might be static, but our relationship to that space is dynamic, then how do we engage in making rituals or having conversations? Uh, you know, for instance, in Philadelphia, if someone has been has lost their life due to a bike accident, in many places there's like a yeah. white bike mm. uh, or flowers, I, yeah, or flowers or something like this, where that's a community based. Yeah. Uh, and I think both Ken and Christian are talking about an important dialogue and a community based 
um, engagement that makes the understanding of monuments more dynamic. Mm. Um, but still there's something with people in the margins. I was also think really busy with like homeless people, mm. which, uh, is where I'm from is, is very visible and a problem, but, and not really visible in the Dutch context. So to bring it back to the Dutch context, I wonder what kind of surveying and discourse could be had so that more varying histories could be visible. Right. And what that would do to creating something. A more a more inclusive history and a more inclusive notion of, of you know, who to memorize or who to make memorials for. But if you change it to a Dutch context and to use a monument of memorial, if you go to Dam Square, the monument on Dam Square, which every May 4th is used as a rem place of remembrance, mm -hmm. but also, also on, on May 5th, there's a great stage built opposite of the monument and, you know, every everybody celebrates freedom. And that's an occasion that happened more than 70 years ago already. Um, how do we... Is that an example of what Christian described or should we be more engaged with the monuments or should we think radically different? I mean, I'm up for thinking radically different mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, personally. Um, and I love that example of the monument in Dom Square and things that happen, which I would call ritual, like people gather. Um, but I also noticed that there's that not everyone is represented there. So right. who is gathering and why are they gathering? Mm -hmm. um, and does it need to be built? Like, can a tree be a monument where, in terms of just thinking about history and organic and things that are dynamic, but maybe at a slower pace or that change at a slower rate and scale? I, yeah, I sort of, I'm curious about a, a total reimagining, which is, you know, why I'm really happy to be a part of this conversation. Like what would a total reimagining be in the context that we're in? Who would we talk to? How would surveying begin? Mm -hmm. um, what is history? Whose history is it? What are the conversations around that? And, and again, like going back to, uh, we were talking sort of off the, off the record about um, monuments being a reminder I think there is a point in the notion of reminding that you can actually have a really intersectional approach hmm. because that's subjective. Like something, if we look at the same object, I might be reminded of something slightly different than you're reminded of. And but, that's but okay. In that, re in that regard, something that we addressed with Ken as well is that, um, you know, existing monuments that where new perspectives and new narratives have yeah. been added, you know, and which are not c uh, inclusive. For example, the monument of J.P. Kuhn here in, 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 in Holland. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about, you know, tearing it down. Should we tear it down? Should we s put something beside it? Should we adapt it? What's your stance on that? Um, I, again, I think as Ken mentioned, like the tearing down without a dialogue is, I think, a slippery slope. Mm. Um, I'm curious about an adaptation or an augmenting because I think, uh, you know, like I was born in the seventies and the history books that I was getting taught from when I was in school in the eighties tell a different story than the history books now. Yeah. And for me as a black person uh, with African diasporic background and indigenous background, it's really important for me to know about how the his, the stories change and not erase the previous story because mm -hmm. that also influences my identity. I think it's the same with monuments. I don't want to erase like, okay, if you want to tear something down, I want evidence of whether, you know, there's a winner and a loser. I think it's actually really complex. There's like an underworld an underlife, and then what's visible And I'm really for integrating those things, which I think that's the juicy part. That's the exciting part, especially as we move towards technology and multi multimedia approaches to even what is a monument. Can we be more expansive and have a conversation? So uh, tearing it down, this particular mm -hmm. monument, no. Adding to or having something adjacent where these two things yeah. can be in conversation. Yeah. 
Great. Fantastic. <laughs> um, if I found a question before we close off, um, this is, uh, this program is a starting point. We saw two great examples. We saw two great thinkers about monuments. If there's advice you should give the, us already and Andy Zemwolf in developing conversations, what advice would you give? Mm. Um, I would think in a, in a concise answer, but, uh, I think what's curious is that, um, we're having a conversation and it's one of many, um, of who, who is present at the table and who is mm. absent. Mm. I mean, this is the thing with history. Who do we miss at the moment? Do you think, um, I, I heard a lot of discussion uh, around community and uh, you also mentioned yourself that isn't this the case with monuments where it's elite? Mm. I think it is. Mm. If we want to change, do we want to change that? <laughs> My advice would be to have a position. If our position is yes, we do want to change that. Then who needs To be present. Yeah. I was alive and present during some, the example that Ken gave around the move bombings. I lived in West Philly. I'm from West Philly. Mm. And that's a part of my life. I was alive and I saw smoke in the air. Yeah. So I remember that. And I was like, yes, add my Ken, if you can hear me, add my vote to the monuments for the move mm. bombings. But there's such a rich cultural history in the Netherlands. And If we're going to move forward and we do want to make designing and erecting of monuments less elite, then we really need to look at who's missing from the conversation. I do not think it is just academics. I do not think it's just men. I do not think it's just architects. I don't think it's just adults. I think it can be children. I think it can be elders. Mm. And then what starts to happen, what kind of conversations, like if we're going for something that can heal and move also forward our collective memory, we need as many different perspectives as possible. And it needs, we need to identify the position of the people involved. I do a lot of work around positionality mm -hmm. where it's important that there's a dialogue also where you come from, where I come from, yeah. where that person comes from. So then we see a picture that is not so fractured and right. then people can if our aim is to create something that has a universal, it can touch uh, in a universal way to not homogenize who's mm -hmm. relating, but to actually celebrate the diversity of who's relating to the object. Yeah. This, I think we need to just have more, more variety in who's having the conversation. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining in. Thank you for your opinions mm -hmm. and thank you for your sharing your stories as well. Well, We have come to the end of this first program about uh, unmonumenting. Like I said, it's the kickoff. It's a starting point. It's gathering ideas, gathering few, uh, few visions and trying to develop new visions on how to continue further. Um, if you want to know more about the project of Stichting and Zemberg, keep an eye out on their website and the social channels. And more info about this will come soon. And tomorrow, the Stadskuratorium are, are organizing a dialogue on inclusive public space. If you're interested in joining there and having your con his voice heard there as well, please check out the stadskuratorium.nl. Keep an eye out as well for the Pakhuis Zwijger Agenda because interesting programs dealing about public space are pre presented there as well. So check out the website. If you would like to make a financial contribution to programs like these, it is possible via the Zwijger.nl slash pay. And those uh, contributions will benefit the programs directly in these complicated times. Um, again, thanks to all the speakers, Ken, Christian and Joy. Uh, this is a starting point. So I hope to see you later on in the conversation and we shall make it more inclusive. We shall be aware of who is on uh, who's at the table and we will make sure that uh, many voices will be heard. Thank you so much for watching us and hope to see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>